This webinar is hosted by the St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management, also known as LILO PRISM. And we are one of eight PRISMs that span the state of New York, creating a network of partnerships as an integrative approach to invasive species management. And the PRISM network is funded by the Environmental Protection Fund in coordination between the Department of Environmental Conservation and various host organizations. The boundaries of the Slilo PRISM include the five counties of Oneida, Oswego, Jefferson, Lewis, and part of St. Lawrence. And Slilo PRISM is hosted by the Nature Conservancy and we collaborate with regional and statewide partners to protect our lands and waters from the impacts of invasive species. I'd like to welcome our guest speaker, Anise Dobson, a postdoctoral researcher at Yale University, who is involved in research focused on the impacts of jumping worms, white-tailed deer, and other stressors on native plant communities in Northeastern Canada and the United States. Currently, she is working to identify the movement of jumping worms and assess their impacts on soil and plant communities. Anise, feel free to share your screen when ready. Great, right, thanks so much for the introduction. Okay, um, Megan, before you go away, how do, how do we look? Looks, Looks great. great. Okay, mm -hmm. fantastic. All right, um, so I will request that any of you uh, feel free to put questions into the chat box um, and we'll take a couple of breaks throughout to take a look, uh, maybe if there's anything relevant. Um, so just to introduce myself a little bit, it was very cool to see in the chat box coming in that there's lots of people from New York State and this side of the border, but also lots of people from the other side of the border. Um, where I originally grew up in the Ottawa Valley in Ontario, Canada, um, on a vegetable farm. And this is where I really got to think about earthworms. And as many of you who have been farmers and gardeners have been um, experiencing earthworms throughout your life, you probably had a really positive relationship with them um, and how they affect soil health. And one thing that I found really interesting about this coming from that background is that it's some of those same traits that make earthworms so good uh, in some contexts that can make them so destructive in others. <clears throat> so the, the big question that always comes up um, when I'm talking to people is, are earthworms good? Are they good or are they bad? Uh, and I would like you to keep in mind that that question is a little bit too simple um, to actually tackle, uh, a little bit too simple to be helpful. So I want you to ask three different questions within that. So. Um, thinking about habitats. Not all habitats are going to be the same. Uh, this is this is my mom standing in her uh, outstanding in her field, and that habitat is going to be really really different from um, the old growth forest that's uh, just on the on the other side of that. So the farmland it's going to be plowed regularly. What you're planting in there is fast growing annuals, and if the fertilizer or the pH isn't right, or the nutrients or the or the pH isn't right, you can amend the soil. Um, for the crops that you're putting in. Plants growing in a forest habitat are getting a really different um, a really different experience. So the, the soil mixing is much slower than in plowed fields, mostly done by uh, fungi and bacteria. Uh, and the species that grow there are tend to be slow growing perennials. And uh, if they if they have any um, nutrient struggles, they need to do things like associate with mycorrhizal fungi um, in the habitat as opposed to being able to rely on amendments from farmers. So not all habitats are the same. Not all plants need the same thing. So two of my study species, they're both uh, really great native species that are really important for um, their ecosystems. Poison ivy here on the left and uh, false Solomon seal here on the right. So, po uh, so poison ivy, it grows quickly and it has a lot of flexibility in its life form. So sometimes you'll see it as sort of a, a, a shrub growing in some places. Sometimes it's a vine up a tree. Other places it looks quite herbaceous going right along the ground. 
um, and it can seek out different microhabitats um, if where it's growing isn't quite right. So something like the false Solomon seal on the other side, this is a slow long-lived perennial. They take a long time to mature and they can live for decades. Um, we don't really know how old they can get, maybe even up to like 70 plus years. Um, they are really dependent on mutualists um, and they're evolved to live in the duff layer, in the organic horizon specifically. The third question within that, are earthworms good umbrella, is that not all worms are the same. So um, people often think about earthworms as being this one species, but in fact, it's a huge, uh, huge different group of different families, different species. And some of the some of the ones that we have around here include the jumping worm that we're going to focus on today. But there's also a family of lumbricid worms that have been here for a little bit longer. Uh, but we also have some native worms that are um, that are you'll you'll see them pretty rarely. They're in kind of unique habitats, probably not what you're going to come across in your garden. Uh, but there's so little known about them, and and we need to be really careful when we're managing to make sure that we're not uh, negatively affecting these populations that we know so little about. <clears throat> so a quick outline of the day. Um, we're going to do a quick overview on earthworms in North America, dive into jumping worms specifically. We're going to just go through their impacts on soil, plants, and then how those how they interact with other stressors in, in forests. Um, and then we're going to do some of the practical stuff, prevention, mitigation, uh, and some identification. So if you look at North America um, about 12,000 years ago, it was mostly covered by, um, by an ice sheet. And so the idea was that if we had much in the way of earthworms in sort of our little corner over here of North America, um, they were pushed off by the last glacier and have been pretty slow to recolonize. Um, and what we're seeing both in Ontario and in New York State is this concept of uh, global warming. It's kind of happening all over the globe. Um, there's a small subset of the 7,000 plus earthworm species that are quite good at invading into temperate and tropical ecosystems. And they're doing different things depending on where they're going. So in some places, it's the displacement of native earthworms. Um, in places uh, that we work in mostly it's it's going to be more likely to be displacing previous invasions by those lumbricid earthworms um, and invading into new habitats as well. <clears throat> uh, what does this look like? So this is a schematic of what we would have in the in the forest here in the northeast historically where the leaf litter falls at the end of the season um, stays on the surface and slowly gets incorporated mostly into the top of the soil. Um, by fungi and microbes and other arthropods. And this, this is kind of the spongy layer that you walk on if, if you walk into a place like the Adirondacks or Algonquin Park, uh, that you can still see this thick, orga thick, orga thick organic horizon there today. And that microhabitat is um, the place that all of the different, um, the complex community of flora and fauna um, that have evolved in our forests have really relied on that um, organic horizon. When earthworms move into a forest, they're, the main thing that they're doing is consuming a lot of that organic matter, the leaf litter, and mixing it up. So instead of having these distinct layers, it becomes much, much more homogenous. And then you lose things like the plant community, um, the arthropod community, etc. So jumping worms, we're gonna dive into this specifically. They're in the family Megascolesidae. Um, and around here, we've got three co-invading species of um, what some people call Amenthus and some people call Amenthus and Metifier. It's kind of still in up for debate which one um, we're gonna go with. Uh, so in, um, in the Northeastern United States, uh, they're introduced from East Asia around the 1940s. And one thing to keep in mind is uh, they weren't just introduced one time. They were probably introduced multiple times, hundreds of times, uh, 
maybe a thousand times in different places. So it's it's kind of unique in that way. And we'll come back to that concept. Uh, but they stayed in pretty low numbers for a long time. Um, and it's really only in the last 10 to 20 years that their populations have really expanded. Um, and in Ontario, it's kind of in the last five years or less. The first jumping worms were identified in Canada in 2014. <clears throat> so um, a big group of us from around the world uh, sorry, a small group of us from around the world have started diving into some questions about jumping worms. And I'll just give you a little, um, an introduction to a group that we're starting to develop um, led by Joseph Gores at UVM. So it's a bunch of us, mainly researchers, but also people in extension, in industry. Um, we're trying to build out some of that component a little bit more. Uh, called the Healthy Forest Collaborative, and we're um, trying to understand the different effects of jumping worms. So you'll see some of those names pop up again and again. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is just show you a video of jumping worms, especially for those of you that might not have seen them. Um, their behavior is kind of the first thing to recognize when you're looking at um, trying to identify them. So this, this is Brad, our colleagues. But their density can get really high like that on the forest floor. Um, they do this sort of thrashing movement. All right. <clears throat> so if you d were to dig a little pit into the different forests, so a little hole, and you're looking at sort of the top, um, 50 centimeters here. Um, in an uninvaded forest like that Adirondack forest or um, Algonquin Park forest, you're gonna see, like I mentioned, the uh, leaf litter building up here, lots of roots, lots of fungal hyphae, and then a distinct horizon of organic rich soil. Um, and then we've got the bee horizon down here. When earthworms more generally show up, so this is like the lumbricid earthworms that have been here for hundreds of years, that this is that homogeneous soil profile that I was talking about. So kind of acting like a plow, mixing up the, the nutrients. Um, with jumping worms, it looks a little bit different. It's hard to get a horizontal picture of the soil because what they do is they, um, when they consume all of those, that organic horizon in the top, um, they make these little pellets that are very crumbly and just fall into the hole. So it's hard to take a picture, but essentially the top, um, depending on how far the uh, invasion has gone, six inches or 15 centimeters especially, um, have these pellets on top. <clears throat> and this is the crux of the problem. So it's not the worms themselves um, that are the big problem. It's what they do to the soil. And this is some really wacky looking soil. Like you can walk into any forest that has jumping worms and you will immediately know something is wrong here. <laughs> Um, so there are these sort of pebbly textured um, soil pieces that that they create with their excrement. And one thing that I'll point out is that a, there's a bunch of seedlings that have tried to germinate here. And what's happened is they've kind of dried out, gone um, sort of pushed up to the surface and um, and died. And there's really nothing coming up in the soil at all. And that is quite indicative of jumping worm soil. <clears throat> so through their, their actions, uh, mostly the changes to the soil is where all of their effects are kind of resonating out from. So the mixing and the mineralizing of the organic horizon, um, reducing carbon storage, um, and then creating these large loosely assembled aggregates. And one thing that I uh, didn't mention yet is that this soil is extremely prone to erosion. And this is how I got into working with jumping worms to begin with. I was working on a deer project and all of the castings, it was like on a hill and there was a deer fence and all of the castings would tumble down the hill and collect at the deer fence. And um, yeah, it was just really, really jarring to see. What this can look like in terms of infrastructure, um, a lot of, trails, a lot of stairways and infrastructure in parks gets really affected. Um, this is a picture from New York City where I work, but also 
that erosion of the little soil pellets can get into drainage um, uh, culverts and things like that. And then you can see field flooding and problems coming from that. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> they have, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> they impact um, things like grass in fields um, <clears throat> and, and, um, the consequences then for plants, so include low germination, it's hard for those seedlings to germinate. The existing plants, um, the roots are really sensitive to that all of that air and that fluffy soil, so they will desiccate. And it also creates really unstable rooting. Um, if you've been into a heavily invaded site, you can just pick a seedling, a tree seedling that should be really rooted in the ground. You can pick it out of the soil with just no effort at all. Um, so I'm going to give you a little brief overview of some of the research that we're doing before we get into the practical stuff. Um, <clears throat> so here is a little bit of work from uh, New York City, a bunch of different boroughs, and we looked at the percent cover of native plant species here and how it was impacted by jumping worms and also um, other human impacts. So sort of the, this you can think about as um, the intensity of other human impacts, like roads and trails. <clears throat> and what we saw in these, in these plots is that um, the percent cover of native plants is much, much higher, around 25, 30% in the plots that don't have jumping worms, but down here around 10% um, with jumping worms. And it was quite interesting that as you go and uh, go through like more urbanization, more human impact on that landscape, that's not really affecting the native plants nearly as much as the jumping worms. We also measured richness. So that's uh, a measure of biodiversity that is quite simple. It's just really counting up the number of native species in different plots. And we see a really similar pattern. So human impact is having some negative impact on the percent uh, on the richness of native plant species, uh, but it's really the jumping worms that are having a huge impact. <clears throat> when we look at the plants that New York State has designated as invasive, so this isn't, uh, this is specifically pulling out the invasive species from the bigger umbrella of non-native plant species, uh, we see kind of the inverse. So Jumping worm plots have tons of cover of invasive plants up here around 50%. Um, whereas the plots without jumping worms had closer to about 30% cover of invasive plants. <clears throat> what was kind of interesting, you'd expect that the, the richness of so the number of invasive plants would follow a similar pattern like it did for the native plants, but it didn't. It was This looked a whole lot more like the native richness graph. So what this is saying to me is that it's not uh, it's not all invasive plants that can benefit from jumping worms. It's only a really, really small number, right? So you've got a lower diversity of jumping worms, a, a lower diversity of invasive plants with jumping worms, but a much, much bigger cover. So a few of those ones are really winning out. Uh, within the native plants, it wasn't, uh, they of course didn't all respond the same. So some native plants were quite resistant to jumping worms, things like poison ivy um, that can sort of cruise along the soil, like in this picture here, and set down little roots here and there as it goes. Uh, but also things like Johnny jump seed, which is an interesting one. It can, um, if it topples over in this unstable rooting conditions, um, that stem can then become sort of a root and then new stems can come off of that. So it loves to be in unstable conditions. It can just reproduce and reproduce. Some of the species that were the, the losers in this situation included um, Trillium and True Solomon Seal. And you'll notice that the roots are quite distinctive. They have these um, sort of big, um, um, they're, they're not very branched. They have big storage organs. Um, and that's gonna come in, port, come in in a little bit as well. But of course we know that forests are not just experiencing jumping worms as the only thing they have to contend with. Um, so both in New York State and Ontario, uh, we've got 
a big abundance of white-tailed deer uh, with in, um, impacts to wolf communities, changes in land use, where we have a lot of these fragmented forests that have lots of nutrients here and lots of safety here, lots of edges, deer love that. And they're also just really good at coexisting with humans. Um, we know that they're preferentially choosing the palatable species like Trillium and picking out the largest individuals specifically. Um, there's also a lot of invasive plants that we've got. Um, I'm gonna talk specifically about Japanese stilt grass, uh, which we know competes with native species and also impacts nutrient cycling in forests. <clears throat> and I'm going to um, walk you through this multiple stressors approach that we take to try and understand which things in the whole suite of stressors that are being thrown at a forest, climate change, pollution, uh, deer, invasive plants, invasive earthworms, which of those are the drivers of change from something like this on the left to something like this on the right, and which things are just kind of along for the ride. So if you've got a native plant that's growing uh, in the forest and it gets browsed on by a deer, it historically would be able to um, go dormant, absorb a lot of its nutrients back into its um, storage organs and then take another try next year. And that's a strategy a lot of different plants have. Um, but when the rooting conditions are really stressed out, then there goes its plan B. And then when it's um, then in competition with native plants that can maybe, sorry, invasive plants that can start earlier, um, that uh, can root faster and grow faster, take advantage of nutrients faster. Um, what do all of these things do together? A few different ways that I study this, uh, some deer exclosures, but also in New York City, there's a nice, nice natural experiment with different abundances of, of deer, kind of extremely different abundances of deer. Um, one thing that we do in different places is we put out sentinel plants. So we plant some species that are uh, common in those forests or should be common in those forests, either um, tree species or sort of understory species, um, ferns, a whole bunch of different things. Um, and we see how those plants do over year over the different years with the different stressors. <clears throat> and uh, one thing that's kind of interesting here, we're going to talk about zigzag gold goldenrod survival. So this is a native forest goldenrod. And um, as the <clears throat> survival of this plant that we planted changes with jumping root density. And this is some work done with uh, Tim McKay and Andrea Davalos. And we see that over here where you have no invasive plants and no jumping worms, everybody is surviving really, really nicely. Um, as you go across and increase the number of jumping worms you've got in the plot, if you've got no stilt grass, the, the plants can still survive. Um, it's over here where you've got a ton of jumping worms and a ton of stilt grass that you start to see the impacts. So forests can be quite resilient. You can throw one thing at them, you can throw two things at them, but when you're throwing all of these different things, that's when the big problems start to happen. Um, similarly with deer, uh, we've got a different species here, the false Solomon seal with increasing jumping worm density. Uh, with the presence and absence of deer. And again, over here, if you've got no deer and uh, no jumping worms, everybody's surviving pretty well. Um, <clears throat> as you go along and increase in jumping worms, the plants can survive as long as there are no deer. Um, but it's down here where you've got really, really heavy browse press pressure, as well as jumping worms that you see um, extinction of these of these local communities. So jumping worms are associated with the dominance of a small number of invasive species. And when combined with other stressors, that's when jumping worms are associated with local extinctions of some native plant species. All right, um, what does this mean for the rest of the ecosystem? I'm just gonna give you a little tiny glimpse of this. There's so much more to say, uh, but we can't say it all. So <clears throat> jumping worms, we, we show that they're really influencing the native and invasive plant communities. And that's going to have impacts on the birds that are feeding on these plants, that are nesting in these plants. Um, another big impact is on the um, 
on the other soil arthropods. Um, and these are gonna be major food sources for things like birds and for salamanders. Um, one thing that we see when we look at any place on the food chain where jumping rooms have invaded, we're seeing a signal and it's not good. So what can you do to prevent invasion? Um, in New York State, there's currently some policy that um, you're uh, knowingly selling jumping worms is uh, comes with a warning. And then eventually, if you are doing it over a while, then there can be fines and penalties. Uh, it's really hard to deal with them once they've arrived. So a key thing is prevention. Right now, the management options are pretty limited, um, pretty time consuming and once the jumping rooms are established. So focusing on prevention and medication, pretty key. Um, I'm going to explain how they're moving and what you can do with a little bit of a story about New York City. That's a big transportation and shipping hub. And so it's a great place to study invasive species. <clears throat> Um, one of the many places that jumping worms first appeared in New York City was at the Bronx Zoo, where it's documented in this um, article of Life magazine that um, the platypus exhibit came in and everyone was really excited. And um, to feed them, they brought in worms from all across the world, including uh, jumping worms. <clears throat> So we know that they were at the Bronx Zoo and a lot of other places in New York City in the 40s, uh, but they weren't identified in natural areas until the 1980s. And even when the Natural Areas Conservancy went in and did a survey across all five boroughs in 1,200 plots, they only found about 12% of those plots had jumping worms. When we went back and resampled in 2019, 2020, we found that that number jumped from 12 to 64% of the plots. So something happened in here between 2013 and 2019. And one possible hypothesis is um, Hurricane Sandy. So a lot of trees came down um, and they were chipped for biofuel and landfill cover um, as well as mulch. And where the city did lots of best management for the invasive species that people were thinking about at the time, like Asian longhorn beetle, jumping worms were just not on anyone's radar. Um, so they gathered up the mulch, made a pile, and then took this pile out to all of the different parks to use for um, things like trails, especially. So if you've got an infestation in the mulch pile, then that's going out everywhere. One little bit of hope though, is right beside um, right beside the Bronx Zoo is this place called the Thane Family Forest. And 14 million people each year walk from the Bronx Zoo where there's definitely jumping worms to the Thane Family Forest where there are really very, very, very few jumping worms. So that should give you hope. And they still have a deep organic horizon as if this were in the Adirondacks or as if there were this were in Algonquin Park. Um, it's a little hard to pinpoint what exactly they're doing right, though, because they're kind of doing everything right. So it wasn't logged. Um, they also make their own mulch on site, propagate their own plants on site, where they have to bring in plants. They're doing bare root plantings, um, and they also have deer excluded. So this combination of different management practices has kept jumping worms largely out of this site right next to the Bronx Zoo for the 70, 80 years that they've been around. <clears throat> uh, so mulch being a key pathway is one possible explanation, but there's all sorts of other potential explanations. So lots of urban tree planting programs, lots of high moisture year. Jumping worms didn't just explode in New York City, they've kind of exploded everywhere. Um, so we can't say for sure which of these is the driving force, but... Um, <clears throat> but um, they're all important to contend with. So that's the bad news. Um, some of the good news is that jumping worms are, are, not, are not like all, uh, not all invasions are the same. So here's three different invasive species that we have had in New York State. Um, the chestnut blight that also showed up for the first time at the Bronx Zoo. And this, uh, this was carried on the wind 
and have largely wiped out the American chestnut um, from its functional role in the forest within a couple of decades. So really, really fast. Um, things like the emerald ash borer, we really slowed them down by slowing down movement of firewood, some changes in our behavior. Jumping worms, if you remember back to the Thane family forest, they are really not moving very much on their own. <clears throat> so the importance, they kind of fall on the very, very far side of how important humans are to their transport. So small changes that we can make can have a big impact. <clears throat> um, so if any of you coming from Ontario are thinking that you're gonna be safe from the threat of jumping worms because of those cold winters, um, unfortunately think again. The This plot here shows the thermal tolerance of jumping worms in the dark gray. Um, so they they are pretty, their eggs are pretty tolerant to cold. So um, the cold is not going to stop the worms. Uh, one little hint though, is that even though there are all of these jumping worms throughout Northeastern United States, they really, didn't move into Ontario until recently. And so the, the key hint here is not the cold, not that Canada is colder, but there, there's a pretty strict border um, in between the two places and it's hard to move soil and uh, mulch across. So jumping worms um, from my research, mostly spreading through soil and mulch um, but also still moving through things like waterways as the er, as the eggs erode down the um, down the banks and into the water through compost, um, yard waste when people are dumping that in natural areas, uh, tire tra treads, and then to a lesser degree but still possible snuck into bait um, and little cocoons in the boot treads. <clears throat> so some things that you want to think about if you don't have jumping worms, even if you do, um, is the supply chain of your mulch and your topsoil and your compost. So best thing to do for getting mulch is get it directly from the tree. Um, in some places, like here in Connecticut where I live, you can just, when the um, utilities trucks comes by and cut the trees um, underneath the power lines, they will chip it and you can just wave them down and then they will dump it. They're very glad because otherwise they have to pay to get rid of it. <clears throat> um, so if you can get the mulch directly from the tree to the truck to your, your yard, that's ideal. It's when they're sitting in a pile somewhere for a long time that the mulch becomes a problem. Um, the other really cool thing that one of our collaborators, Brad Herrick, um, and some of his, some of the people he works with, they found that the eggs are not very, they're resilient to cold, but not hot. So if you can heat up these materials to 104 Fahrenheit um, over th three days or more, and make sure that it doesn't get reinfested, then that's enough to kill any eggs. Um, Another thing is if you're planting things like trees or shrubs going for bare root seedlings, uh, you don't need to treat jumping worm infested plants like this was COVID. So it's not like anything that's touched a jumping worm is a problem because their cocoons are visible to the human eye. So as long as there aren't big chunks of soil um, on the roots, then you're in good shape. <clears throat> If you are doing if you are doing some gardening or some planting, worth just when you pop out that plant, taking a look at the soil, making sure it looks like something like this or um, or proper soil, and then it doesn't look like these little pieces of ground beef or um, little pellets. So this is a sign that there's jumping worms in that soil, even if you don't see any worms. Um, one thing that, that we do sometimes to assess the earthworm community is to use mustard powder mixed with water um, that will bring the worms up to the surface. But just take care that if this doesn't bring up any jumping worms, this doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have them. Uh, it's moisture, it's temperature, it's season dependent. Um, so think of this that it can be a, a positive, but there can be false negatives. Um, oh, and the, actually the other thing I wanted to mention is that this isn't really a practical management strategy. So if you have jumping worms, you're really not going to be able to get enough mustard to um, impact the population. 
one thing that can be really good if you're doing something like a community plant sale where you have a lot of person, you have a lot of volunteer help, um, is you can do some root washing. So even if you have jumping worm infested plants, you can rinse them, um, you can take them out of the soil, you can fill a bucket with water, rinse them, kind of make sure that all of the visible clumps of soil are taken out. And then the key thing is to strain that rinsing water out so any solids get caught. And then you can just heat, heat treat the solids before you throw them away and then the water below can get dumped out. Um, you can come back to this for uh, for the step-by-step -step process because this is going to be sent around to you. Um, and then after you're done that, you can put it on a on a on a bench. Just make sure that you've got something to prevent the worm from crawling up. They can actually crawl up onto tables, especially if these legs are made out of wood or something like that. Uh, but just a cheapy funnel that you put upside down uh, that prevent the worms from crawling up can be really effective. So um, as I mentioned in New York State, there are laws and regulations around jumping worms, but it's very hard to implement. So the better option is um, shopping local, communicating with businesses that this is important to you, they should be thinking about this, um, and, and working with them on this, I think is, is probably the best, the best way forward. Um, another thing to think about is if you have big machinery moving through your forest or your farm or whatever, um, moving from place to place, make sure that you're not moving soil from place to place. So especially if you have like a logging contractor coming in, uh, putting something in that contract that they're spraying down their wheels between sites. This is going to help with um, invasive plants getting in also, um, not just jumping worms. If you do worm compost, um, just make sure that you've got the right species. So these red wigglers, these are the ones you do want. They're not destructive in forests and they have these little yellow bands. That's how you can identify them. Um, if you do have jumping worms on your property, make sure that you're not dumping infested yard waste into natural areas. Um, and just being cognizant, seeing the signs, especially if you're up in Ontario, uh, where jumping worms are still pretty, pretty rare. Um, this is a key thing to be looking for. <clears throat> so the soil, the worms are only visible kind of in the summer, late summer, but the granulated soil you can see all year round. <clears throat> so an uninvaded forest might look something like this. Um, those lumbricid worms, maybe the soil looks quite mixed up, something like this or something like this. But the jumping worm soil have these really distinctive clumpy um, castings on the top. <clears throat> I'm going to come back to this, this visualization a bunch of times here um, about the life cycle of jumping worms, because this is really key. You can look for jumping worms, but really late summer, early fall. Um, at this time of year, you're probably not going to be seeing any jumping worms. They're overwintering as cocoons. May and June, they're going to start popping up as these small juveniles, they're annual species. So they'll all be right about the same size. Um, and then it's really in July through October that they're much easier to see. Um, the jumping worms are quite big. They're similar, they're somewhat similar looking in size at least to the night crawler, the Canada night crawler, which is not actually originally from Canada. Um, but some ways to tell it apart is that the, the jumping worm is going to be uh, much more metallic and shiny, and it's going to be kind of the, the same color the whole way down the worm, versus the night crawler has got a very, very dark head and a very light tail. Um, another thing about the tail in the night crawler is it's kind of flattened, called the beaver tail. And that's part of how it propels itself along, versus the jumping worm, it's much more tubular all the way down. If you're catching them in um, the sort of late summer and they become uh, reproductive, then you can use the clitellum to identify them. In the jumping worm, it's very close to the head and it tends to be sort of pink or milky or mother of pearl colored versus in the night crawler, it's gonna be red or brown and kind of like a saddle just on the back of the worm versus in the jumping worm, it goes all the way around in this smooth, smooth clitellum. <clears throat> 
Um, this is just something for your reference. If you want to identify them down to species, you can look at this, but it is very tricky to do. <clears throat> um, and then another thing that you can do is follow the research. So uh, Miriam and Joseph at University of Vermont are two people working on this quite a bit. Uh, Miriam has this cool work on um, fungal biocontrol that looks really promising as long as you apply it in sort of the spring. But as of yet, um, um, <clears throat> there it's it's not labeled for that, so you shouldn't. I don't recommend it at this point yet. We haven't tested it fully for the um, other non-target effects on things like salamanders, uh, but also things like these native worms that we know so little about. So stay tuned for that. Hopefully, um, hopefully there'll be some some progress on that. Um, if you already have jumping worms, what can you do to mitigate the damage? Um, so keeping in mind that they have this annual life cycle, most of the things that you're going to do are going to be most effective here in the spring. So now and in, over the next couple of months. Once you get into July, August, September, October, those adult worms move very fast. So anything that you do, they might leave, but then they might just come back. Um, <clears throat> so one thing you can think about is heat is your friend. They're very sensitive to heat. So if you've got raised beds, um, solarization for these early spring months could be a really good way to um, get that temperature up inside the bed and kill any eggs. Um, some extension offices have, have soil steaming apparatuses that are mainly thinking about getting rid of uh, weeds, but they also work really well to get rid of jumping worms. So this is a really, really good thing that you can do if you've got an infestation in a farm or garden center, something like that. Um, but again, thinking about doing this in spring or in fall, once the adult worms disappear so that you're targeting the eggs. Um, yeah. And another thing to do is manage the things that you can. So if you, the jumping worms are pretty hard to manage. Deer, invasive plants, they're also a little bit tricky, but um, things like putting up fences or maybe bringing in hunting, um, kind of depending on, on where you are, can be a good way to alleviate some of the stress on the plant communities. Um, another thing you can do if you're doing any kind of restoration or you're thinking about gardens is cultivating deep-rooted species. A lot of the jumping, jumping room impacts are in the top of the soil. So if you can get bigger plants that grow deeper, um, their roots are going to be made mainly out of uh, where the jumping worms are having the biggest impact. And so things like pollinator gardens, prairie gardens um, seem to be pretty good, pretty resilient um, at not only withstanding jumping worms, but also sort of keeping them at bay. Um, you can also experiment with ground covers. So poison ivy did great with jumping worms, but uh, that's never really been a hit with people when I recommend them planting some native poison ivy in their gardens. So uh, there can be other ground covers that might be a little bit more um, acceptable, things like partridge berry. That's quite pretty. Uh, reporting really helps. So Megan is gonna go through and walk you through how to report with IMAPS. Um, in Ontario, I think you use EdMaps. You can also use iNaturalist, which is one that has partnership with IMAP invasives. Um, Seek can actually, in most cases, identify that it is a jumping worm. So uh, that's kind of a fun tool you can use if you're not sure about ID. And this is the, the IMAP invasives is sort of the first stop that I go to when I'm designing an experiment. Um, we have some of these big regional partnerships where we're working with a bunch of people across the different states and provinces. And to be able to actually get something moving, we can't just drive around looking for jumping worms. So having these um, these sites where we know there are or are not jumping worms is so, so, so helpful um, to get big ambitious projects off the ground. So we appreciate um, so much any observations that you can make. So a quick thanks to some funding and partners that made this work possible. Um, and I will take some questions. I think we've got about 15 minutes for questions, but um, if we don't get two questions of yours, feel free to, uh, well, maybe Megan will figure yeah. out the rate. 
you get those to me. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually a few questions in the Q and A chat box. If you want to just like type an answer to those, uh, sure. you know, and then we'll just continue on. And then at the end, if we want to have open discussion, uh, we can do that. How's that sound? Great, great, great. Um, okay, so Sarah, so starting in the Q and A box. Uh, Sarah asked about heat treating of topsoil for 104 for three days. How would you do that in agricultural scale? Um, so if you're talking like big fields, um, yeah, a black tarp is is something that you can definitely use. But um, Joseph found that actually using a clear tarp is even better because it kind of acts like a greenhouse and the temperatures can get up even higher in there. Uh, but I do think that um, black or or clear plastic, if you've got anything like that in terms of a tarp, that'll go a really long way. The tricky thing is that you have to time it right. It would be ideal to do it in the middle of the hot summer, but you also kind of want to do it in the spring um, when you can kill the egg. So if you've got a warm streak in April or May, that is a perfect time to get that tarp on there. Um, and yeah, experimenting with this, those seed steamers, they kind of roll along the field. Um, I haven't used one, but they kind of seem like a really, really good option if you have access to one somehow. Okay, is it possible for adults to survive the winter in a deep leaf mulch pile, which stays warm in the middle? We thought we saw adults in the early spring, but now I'm wondering if I just misidentified. Um, so uh, it depends where you live. If you're in the Slilo prism or north of there, you probably are not seeing jumping worms. Like last year though, I did see a jumping worm here in Connecticut, which is coastal and warm in January um, because it was very, very, very warm. So I think that they can survive into the winter, but probably not over the winter because they are annual species. So they just, they kind of get worse and worse and worse. Like I did a workshop on jumping worms in um, October or November one time and I got some jumping worms and I was like, look everyone, look at them jump. And they just didn't really jump. They looked so sad and uh, old. <laughs> so I, I think that they're, they're probably, the ones that we know for now are not gonna be overwintering. Having said that, there's many different species of jumping worms. And so there might be a new species that's come in that is more perennial. Um, so if you're pretty sure about that, definitely take a picture, shoot that over to uh, me or wherever you're living, um, sort of extension people, um, and we can help you identify it pretty well. Okay, okay. Uh, Anise, how about you answer the rest of the questions just then by typing in the text oh. box? Or like in the Q and A text area, and we'll move on just so we can stay on time, and then we'll oh, save a course. little bit more time at the end if we have some. Sure. And you can stop sharing sure. your screen. Thank you so much. Great, perfect. Okay, so as mentioned, uh, reporting invasive species like jumping worm aids the research and management efforts. So there are multiple observation tools out there, but IMAP Invasives is New York's official invasive species database. And it is managed by the Invasive Species Database Program at the New York Natural Heritage Program, which is a partnership between SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry and the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and funding from the New York State Environmental Protection Fund. However, if you can't use IMAP, you can also report to iNaturalist and that data will be shared to the IMAP platform, but you have to sync or give permission for your data to be shared with, with IMAP for that to occur. So IMAP has a free mobile app that lets you report observations quickly and easily even without Wi-Fi connectivity, which is really perfect for making reports in the field. And there is also an online platform. So if you don't use mobile apps or for whatever reason, you can also report online. And you can also view distribution data on the online version and report and view uh, treatment and survey data as well. 
in the observations and the data reported to IMAP. It can be, be viewed by anyone on this public facing interactive map, which has multiple layers and filtering options. And it makes it pretty easy to find the data that you're looking for. And IMAP can also be used uh, to be a source of notification alert for specific invasive species that you might be wanting to be notified about, which is very helpful for conservation professionals or just project leaders. Next, I'm gonna give you just a very quick uh, brief IMAP mobile app demo. And there are lots of self-guided tutorials and training opportunities available. And I'll share some of the links for those resources in a follow-up email. And I'm gonna stop sharing here and go live with my phone and just show you how to make an observation. Okay, so the IMAP app is the top left here, you see with the leaf and the beetle. You can download it from the Google Play or you know just the app store on your phone. <clears throat> and when you open the app to set everything up, you'll see three lines in the top left and you select the preferences. And if you're in New York, you'd wanna select New York and you would have your username email that you use to make a, an IMAP account typed in this area here and then the password that you used. And if you haven't set up an account yet, you can click on that create account or reset password uh, hyperlink that you see there in blue and it'll bring you to the page where you can make a, an account and get a username and a password. Uh, if you're for the first time using the app, you'll wanna retrieve the IMAP lists or maybe you haven't used the app in a while that's another time to retrieve the list. It just updates all of the information for you. But for now, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, and then the next thing you'll wanna do is select the species name display. If you're good with scientific names, you can toggle that on, or if you prefer the common, you can toggle that in blue. And then the customized species list. This will let you pick the species that you're most likely going to be surveying for. For today's purposes, you just pick, you know, a fake species and then everything's in alphabetical order. So jumping worm would be under J. You'd hit OK. Most of the other options are just leave to default. Uh, there are ways for you to become part of a project or start your own project. So if you are part of one or have your own, you can select the project that you want to be your default. Salilo does have a volunteer surveillance network project where anybody that is searching for invasives in the Salilo region can join that project or, or you, know, you can email me and I can add you. And then if you're part of an organization that has projects in IMAP, you can choose that organ organization as well. And you just hit save. And then you can make an observation. I uh, just select the green button on the top right. Uh, you can take a photo using your camera or you can select one that's already in your in your phone library. Uh, and then you'll see custom list there when it's check marked on, then it's only gonna show you the species uh, that you had selected previously in the preferences. Uh, and then you'd wanna select the drop down under non-selected and that's where you would choose the species that you're making the observation for. For today's purposes, we're just gonna hit fake species. And then you'll choose whether or not you found it or you didn't find it. And it's important to report even if you don't find a species because that just helps prioritize early detection management efforts. So for now, we're just gonna hit not detected. It'll have the date. It'll show a map with the general area of where you're located. If the light and longitude are not showing up, then that means that you need to enable them in your phone setting, just allowing GPS to be enabled. You could select your project, you could select your organization, but you don't have to. It just makes it easier on the online platform on that map, the public map that I mentioned. It makes it easier for you to filter and view the data if you do select a project. And if you are a volunteer 
uh, it's important to put in the time that you've searched because that helps people like me who are working with volunteers just see how active our volunteers are. And then any observation comments, an example of this could be, say you're surveying for like a, a hemlock woolly adelgid or an invasive forest pest, you'd want to maybe know, you know how many trees you looked at during your survey. That's also helpful information. And then you would just hit save. And then you'll get what I'm gonna call a card popping up here. Uh, but the work's not done yet to actually upload it onto the public facing map and onto IMAPS database, you have to actually check mark. So I'm gonna check mark uh, an observation that I did from a hemlock woolly adelgid survey, uh, a not detected observation, just so you can see what happens. So you would check mark it hit the three lines and then upload selected. And then it'll say, are you sure you wanna do this? And then you just hit okay. Might take a minute. Uh, and then it will upload the observation. And then another thing you can notice is um, if you wanted to edit it, you would just hit the little pencil and it would open up the observation again. And you can make any edits that you want. And that's how you make an IMAP observation. And then we're just going to get out of here. And I got to figure out how to stop screen sharing. Stop sharing. Okay. So this is a screenshot of IMAP data on the public facing map that I've been mentioning. So once your data is uploaded, it can be viewed at nyimapinvasives.org on the public map. And this is actually the screenshot for the observation data for the jumping worms represented by the orange data points that you can see here. All these little orange data points are for jumping worm. And then also you'll see iNaturalist observations, which are all the pink data points that you see here on the map. So jumping worms have been confirmed present in Oswego, Oneida, and St. Lawrence counties in the eastern Lake Ontario region. And they are likely present, but underreported in other areas of New York state. So we're hoping that you'll just keep an eye out for the jumping worm and other invasive species and report the observations to IMAP or you know iNaturalist moving forward. So some other ways that you can get involved is to take our Pledge to Protect, which is a fun and easy way to protect your favorite outdoor spaces from invasive species now and for generations to come. So upon signing up, you become what we call a protector and receive a monthly email blog showcasing simple actions that you can take throughout the year to prevent the spread of invasives or to manage invasives on your own property. You'll have access to virtual toolboxes with many resources to help you learn to recognize invasive species you may encounter while enjoying the outdoors, as well as best management practices, guides, and apps. We also have a social media toolkit with pre-made graphics that you can share to spread the word and celebrate becoming a protector. And you'll also get chances to win some pretty cool prizes. So you can scan the QR code that you see on the screen or visit ipledgetoprotect.org to sign up today. And volunteering is a great way to get involved. You can join re removal or restoration efforts, guided paddles, hikes, and lots of other fun events. And those who volunteer with us can also participate in a challenge where you can earn prizes for each level of participation that you achieve. And the links to the Pledge to Protect and volunteer opportunities will be in your follow-up email. So don't worry if you, you know, can't get this code to work now. So that is the end of our presentation. Uh, next, we're going to launch the poll for you to submit your credentials to receive the continuing education credits. And I'll submit the information for the SAF and ISA credits, and I will email those who request a confirmation of attendance as well. But to collect the Master Naturalist credits, you'll have to self-report at the NY Master Naturalist Program website, which I'll provide a link in the follow-up email if you happen to not uh, have that link already. And now we do have time uh, to have an open discussion. If anybody wants to come off mute and you just want to raise your hand, I, and I'll take you off mute.
Um, but I'm going to launch the poll as well too. So just give me a minute to get that launched. So hopefully you're seeing a poll. Okay, I'm seeing a poll on my phone. So go ahead and take your time to work on that poll. And in the meantime, I will check and see if anybody has their hand raised. And Nice, if you wanted to you know, add anything else about any of the other questions that may have popped up, feel free to uh, mute as well. Sure, well, I'll just give it a second in case anybody wants to come off of mute and then I can go through some of the other questions if nobody has any that they want to say out loud. Okay. And I don't see anybody's hand raised. Let me know if you see anybody's hand raised because I have a lot of boxes open up on my screen here. <laughs> um, I don't, do you, can I, can I see that? Oh, I can see that. Okay. Yep. I don't see any hands up. Okay. Well, I can just, there's a lot of good questions in. Yeah. Um, feel free to field some of them now, just to kind of fill this time. We'll just leave the poll open for a few moments and then I'll end up. Yeah, okay, so let's see. Um, so Marion asks, is there research evidence on the viability of eggs? Like would they survive a bird digestive tract? The spread is truly gobsmacking. Um, I don't think anyone has done that. Um, but I don't think that um, eggs moving through the bird digestive tract is a huge uh, is a huge way that they're spread. Just from that New York City example I had, where side by side we got a ton of jumping worms and then no jumping worms. Lots of birds are going between those two places. I do think it's the, the human mediated transport that's really key. Um, but yeah, can a cocoon survive a digestive tract? Don't know. Um, Okay, uh, and how many cocoons will a worm produce in a year? Um, that one is a little bit tricky to answer. It depends on the species, but it's on the order of like 90, 80 to 140, something like that. Um, one of the species, Amenthus tokyoensis, can sort of um, have two generations in a year. Sometimes if it's a warm year, they'll sneak in uh, an extra generation later in the summer. And those are the jumping worms that you'll see. They'll be quite small. They'll produce fewer like on the order of, I don't know, 40 or something like that. Um, they they have an incredible adaptability, jumping worms, but it's, it's not a huge egg production. It's not like thousands. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of, uh, kind of interesting. All right. Keith asks, um, should I dig up in a few spots as it is a large area just to check to see then? How would I stop them or possible spread from there? So I think Keith, Keith, maybe you were the person asking about the um the the pine pine needle mulch. So you don't have to go very far to see jumping around. You don't have to dig, you don't have to do a mustard pour, nothing fancy, really just a little boot kick to scrape away the top layer of the leaves or the needles or whatever, and you'll see if it's like a wet day and in, in late summer, you should be able to see if there's jumping worms. Uh, but also you, that's when you should be able to see the castings is, is right there. You don't need anything expensive to look for them. Okay, Roseanne asking about diatomaceous earth. Um, this is one that people have tested and they have found that diatomaceous earth does nothing to prevent jumping worms. Um, Soil brought into the small slope must have had jumping rooms. Now we have them. Want to protect new evergreens planted in the area, or would heat be the best solution? Um, so depending on how big of an area you're talking about, yeah, heat. Heat is probably the thing that you can do. Uh, but if you're bringing in new evergreens, just selecting bigger um, trees to plant, so maybe a five-year-old seedling instead of a two-year-old seedling, put the money into that. And then the roots will be deeper um, and they'll be out of the jumping worm area. So yeah, it's a little bit of managing the worms, but that part is tricky. So managing the decisions that you make and what you're planting um, can also be useful. All right, um, what else have we got? 
Yeah, the reports along roads pretty telling, but eliminating the hows of spreading might help focus efforts. Yeah, one thing that's interesting is that in their native range, so um, we've got like these three species of jumping worms in Japan, where we have colleagues, they are not in the forest. They have other species of megascolested worms in the forest. These guys are exclusively in ditches. So that's kind of a little bit of a hint about their natural history and how they're moving around. Uh, okay, Julie, would you refresh me on chemical control? So there's not really any good chemical controls right now. There's no, there's none that I can recommend because there's none that are sort of on the books um, as, as having been tested for jumping rooms for chemical control that doesn't also knock out everything else in the area. Okay, so that's the Q&A box. I'll move. There's a oh. new one that just popped up in the chat. Are jumping worm castings more nutrient soluble than other earthworm castings? And are they hydrophobic? Um, could you say that again? I was a little bit distracted. I've got too oh, many. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's also in the chat if you want to read it. But is are jumping worm castings, oh, it moved on me, sorry, more nutrient soluble than other earthworm castings? And are they hydrophobic? Um, that is a great question. I'm going to make a educated guess that they are quite hydrophobic um, because they're pretty resistant to being broken up with moisture and like rain and things like that. They're pretty persistent in the ecosystem. Um, so I, I've I've done a little bit of research on this with carbon, so not other nutrients per se. Um, it's a little bit in the weeds, but essentially um, with carbon, jumping worm castings are doing two different things to the carbon. So letting a bunch of the easily um, digested carbon go into the atmosphere, release the CO2, but then some of it being stored away in, in these really dense packets of soil aggregates. So I won't go into too much detail. You can ask me more about it later, but essentially it is very complicated what they're doing to nutrients, not at all straightforward. And probably this sort of bimodal thing where some things are being released more quickly into the atmosphere, into the water. But other things are being tied up for a really long time. Great, great question. Uh, cannot give it the um, thoroughness it deserves in this, in this time frame. And then there's one more, um, and then I have a question. So is there a way to support funding for this research? Yeah, so that that um, Healthy Forest Collaborative, we're setting it up to act uh, in that way to sort of, um, yeah, work with, with people on, on getting funding from unexpected sources. So, so following that, that'll be a good place to, to think about. But also, there is pretty good funding for this, I will say. Um, lots of places have recognized this as a problem. I think the, the big problem is that it's kind of a discipline, is an orphan in terms of disciplines, right? There are a lot of people that study invasive insects and invasive plants as a field, but invasive earthworms is like this weird thing that doesn't really fit anywhere. So what department, you know, who's hiring an earthworm uh, ecologist, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, yeah. lobby your government, I don't know. <laughs> Perfect, yeah, and uh, Anise, like, so this, the collaborative that you speak of, it's not, it's in development, so it's not officially formed yet, is that correct? Or like, how do people engage with that collaborative? Yeah, we're still kind of trying to develop um, how we're going to work with it, but we know that um, at this moment we are working closely with the state agencies. So your state extension office person, um, we're trying to work across like forestry and natural resources and agriculture and horticulture. Um, but yeah, in interfacing with your state agencies, with your prisms, if you're in New York State, um, is a great way to keep in touch with this. Um, yeah. Okay, Janet Burroughs, brave enough to speak out loud. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. I came late to the party and I I, I apologize. Um, but I kind of live in fear 
of this whole thing. Um, what can a person in their home area and garden do? Um, so it a little bit depends where you are. If you're in Ontario, um, paying close attention to what is coming into your property or wherever you are um, is really key because it's not very widespread. And so you can stop it on its way in. Um, if you are in sort of the Northern forest region, you're like Adirondack, Slilo area, um, kind of the same thing, not super widespread. So being. So uh, it's in Ontario. It is in Ontario. Yeah. I've seen first in 2014 in Simcoe area. Um, Toronto since then I've okay. heard credible story that it was in Kingston and Peterborough um, and a non uh, and a rumor that it was in Ottawa well I'm five miles of water between yeah. the Kingston area and northern New York yeah 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 um, so one thing that you can definitely do is being vigilant along the waterway. That's quite often where they'll come in. Um, so really? taking your walk on the shoreline and watching for those castings. Okay. Yeah. Nice. But um, in terms of like a good silver bullet, uh, <laughs> we don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> well, so yeah, kind of a lot, a lot of different half good solutions. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Uh, Betty, Betty's got a question. Mute. There we go. Hi. Um, they've also been found in Hamilton, Ontario, and Dundas, Ontario. I'm a master gardener from Niagara, and it is something we are constantly vigilant about. Um, the other piece people should be aware of is when people rake their leaves and put them to the end of the road, don't go and collect other people's leaves and put them in your garden as mulch. Um, that brought devastating results to one of the master gardeners in Southern Ontario, and she's still dealing with the uh, jumping worm phenomena out of that. Ooh, yeah, that's that's rough. Um, I think that it could, if you don't have any other options, if you bag them up and leave them in hot, hot August sun for two weeks in a clear or even black plastic bag, um, that you could kill the jumping worms, um, but a better solution, just like you said, not not doing that at all. You know, that super chemically uh, mulch, I've never seen a jumping worm under like that black or like <laughs> red mulch that yeah. is like plastic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't really mean that, but yeah, being vigilant stuff comes from getting mulch straight from the tree to the tree, to the wood chipper, to the truck, to you, great. And how do you encourage um, nurseries and, in our case, the Niagara Parks people even, just mm -hmm. to treat this with the seriousness it deserves? Because nurseries, it's all about making money and they sell invasives. They're not looking for jumping worms. It's a real issue. Yeah, in Ontario, it's tricky. I mean, it's tricky everywhere. <laughs> um, and I will say that I haven't really figured that out yet because I feel like the kind of enthusiasm for the research that I do um, sort of tracks with out of control invasions mm, rather than okay. invasions. So, you know, Connecticut, they're like, yes, find us a solution. But other places where they're just starting to show up, it's like, uh, is this really that important? I don't know. Um, but I do think that money talks so if you if there's like master gardener network is these are my boots on the ground people i i love you all so much you're the reason that i got into this in the first place um but but uh there's it's such a good network that facebook page is really really good um at getting people talking if there's enough customers that are coming in and saying i'm not going to come here anymore if you're not taking this seriously I think that that is one of the most powerful things um, is a lot of people with this sort of bottom up approach to working with um, nurseries. Um, yeah, so that's that's a big one. Getting getting the information out there 
um, it, it is very emotional. If you've seen a jumping worm invasion, um, one of our collaborators, Angela Gupta at University of Minnesota Extension works on the grief around jumping worms, which is real. I've seen it. Uh, I felt it when especially gardeners and master gardeners who work in the soil all the time see these huge changes to the very soil that they stand on. It's very, very distressing. Um, yeah. I could say more, but we'll, we'll stop there. <laughs> thank you so much, Anise, wow. for um, your presentation. Yeah. And thank you for the questions too. These are really great, great questions. And I, I will include Anise's email and the follow-up email so you can continue um, you know, to reach out to, to her. Oh, I'll just say I saw there was a little note that somebody um somebody follows, yeah, my my dad's Facebook page. <laughs> from Planet Pond. We got some some followers in the comments here. Oh, that's uh, funny. That's a cool full circle thing. Yeah. Good, awesome. good, good page to follow if you want. Lots of stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, maybe um email me that link and any other information you want in the follow-up email and you I'll include it there and we can get some people following the page. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Megan. And thanks all of you for, yeah, thank you, Andy. for sticking thank around you. so long. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank you, you so that. much. And just give me, um, I'll send out the follow-up email uh, Monday, sometime on Monday. So I uh, need to get a little bit of time to get me your stuff, but <laughs> sooner than later. <laughs> all right. Bye.